I'm blessed to be work here and work, um, work for a person I really believe cares about the county and cares about the future of this county. And he's, he's done it. He's dedicated his time, energy, and resources to it. But um, he spends hours on end um, trying to make sure Prince George's County is in the best position to move forward. And that's just not political spin. I mean, a lot of us have the opportunity to do a lot of great work. Um, but Mr. Baker particularly um, is passionate about this county and passionate about leadership development and making sure the next generation is at least getting an opportunity to hear some of the mistakes, some of the challenges, some of the successes of um, being in leadership. And I, hopefully we'll have an opportunity to do that today. Um, there's a, always a, a few things of business, uh, kind of order the business I like to do um, whenever we have that opportunity because, again, a number of people who work here, you know, from, I won't say nine to five, from seven, to 12 <laughs> at night, um, also taking a few minutes out of their day to um, just stop in and, and just make their presence known. So I want to do a couple of introductions. Um, but we have our Chief Administrator Officer, Mr. Nick Majette, here as well. Thank you for coming, sir. Um, <laughs> Mr. Majette has uh, taken over the helm of leading this government. Mr. Baker um, selected him a few months ago, and he was formally, appoint formally confirmed by the council and has been an amazing job. Like, I don't know what Mr. Majette does, but I know that he's always running. Every time I see him, he is on his way to a meeting, on the, leaving the meeting, talking to his assistant about the next meeting. So uh, sure enough, Mr. Majette, I know, I know you're working. There's no doubt in my mind on that. Um, we also have um, our Deputy Chief Administrative Officer for Health, Human Services, and Education, my boss, Ms. Betty Hager Francis in the back. Um, and Ms. Francis, just as much, I know she's working because she's working me. Uh, um, but she's leading um, a, large, a large portion of county government, um, our health and human services agencies. So for us government folk, that's the Department of Social Services, Department, the Health Department, and our Department of Family Services, along with an 18,000 um, employee, $1.8 billion um, budget with the school system. So that's a pretty large portfolio. Um, a few other people, and then we'll, we'll formalize the, the, the program today. We have LaVon Thomas, um, who is the County Executive's Community Affairs Manager. We have Ms., uh, Dr. B. Tignor, uh, legendary icon in Prince George's County. Uh, no, you, you got to tell the truth. Dr. B., Dr. B is in every Hall of Fame possible in Maryland, and probably uh, several Hall of Fames across the country. Um, we also have here um, uh, our special, a couple of special assistants of some of our deputy chiefs. Um, Corey Smedley with Public Safety, um, Lavinia Baxter, who's with Economic Development, Infrastructure, and everything else, uh, pretty long title, um, and a few others. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll try to speed the, the discussion on. Um, We'll let Mr. B uh, Baker, the, 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 the he, he wants to sit down first. Um, so there's a couple things we're going to do, and then we're going to kind of move right into a formalized, not a formal, a really a fireside chat. If we had a fire room, we would put some <laughs> fake logs up and, and do some things. We don't but have any fake logs? We, you know, sir, the budget, you understand that, sir. <laughs> we, we're lucky to have a couple, couple bottles of water. <laughs> Um, and, and I apologize. We have a couple of 40 that work here, too, I want to make sure. Courtney Glass, and she's a colleague of mine. Under and our, 40. In, in under 40, in the governmental affairs. Um, she's doing amazing work, and you'll, you'll hear from some of the work that we're doing. She's running those listening sessions I just mentioned, along with most of the legislation in Annapolis. So today's program is going to be um, an intimate conversation with the county executive. We'll have a few topics to talk about. You, you couldn't find anybody else? No, sir. Uh, <laughs> just the person who runs the yeah, county. <laughs> um, but, it, but there's a couple of things we want to do ahead of time. We, we're um, fortunate. Last year we had this conversation um, with the county executive and members of the 40 Under 40. Um, and the, um, we, we, we didn't have a title sponsor, but we are, we're growing uh, now as an organization. So I want to recognize Carrollton Enterprises, Mr. William Steen, for being our title sponsor. <laughs> for this evening, um, um, a simple ask, and he said yes. Um, and we're, we're thankful for, that, for, for allowing us, um, for, for having, having this event for us. So we really appreciate it. With that, I'm going to pass it on to Ms. Tonya Wellens, who we all know um, as the founder of Prince George's County Social Innovation Fund, but probably one of the hardest working women in Prince George's County. And I know that personally. We've been working together for the last couple of months. And, um, She's definitely making sure Prince George's County is moving forward. So with that, Tonya Wellens. Thank you. Thank you all very much. 
Um, thank you for having us again. Thank you, Mr. Baker. Um, we really appreciate you creating the time in your schedule to, to have a fireside chat with us. We know that it's a special opportunity. I'm especially thankful to your, um, actually your entire administration. They've been very, very supportive of me personally and to the Innovation Fund, LaVon, Jackie, my best friend. I, if I could make an honorary 40 under 40, it would be Jackie <laughs> Woody for sure. Um, Ms. Francis, um, Christian, of course. Scott was here earlier. I think Scott may have left out. Barry, I think, oh, Barry's back there. I have friends here, and it's really, really um, a, a distinct pleasure and honor. Um, you listen to us, you respond to us, and you're available. Um, I get to say all of the, the really pleasant things because I've set <laughs> someone up to come and bring the hard questions. So um, before we move into that, uh, I want to make sure that I acknowledge all of the classes. So we are four years in now, which is exciting because as a startup, if you can make it past year one, you've actually done something. Um, but to make it to year four is actually a huge um, feat and success for us. So we're excited about it. Um, 2012 honorees, there are a few here. I refer to that, that class of honorees as my ride or die because um, they've just been with me from the beginning. Can, I, can you just give a quick hands up if you're with part of the 2012 honorees? Um, are you the only one? Maya, 2013. 2013. Mark is my advisory board chair, so of course he has to be here. Um, the 2013 class, they are the fire starters. <laughs> and I think we probably have the largest representative from the honorees from 2014. I have to come up with a name. I think I was thinking of a name for you guys when you come over here. I was thinking of stealth, the stealth bombers or something like that, because <laughs> I'm waiting for you to warm up and, uh, and get started. But I, I see that it's on the way. Mr. Baker, I'd like to just quickly summarize. Every year we do a, a pulse taking of um, honorees just to see what's on, their, what's on their minds, you know, what they're interested in um, and what they care about. And the two issues that keep coming up um, are around education and economic development. Um, you know, these are people who've decided to make Prince George's County their homes. Um, they are investing here with their time, energy, and talents. They want to be able to send their kids to good quality public schools, and you know the story. Um, and they also, because there are several business owners here, who, they want to be able to run their businesses in Prince George's County. They want to be able to connect with contracting opportunities. They want to be able to make a living, living here. Um, and so those two issues keep coming up. And interestingly enough, I'm just looking at the survey results, the other two p issues that come up sort of neck and neck are around leadership and service opportunities. So not only do they want to make a living here, they also want to serve. And it's interesting because I started a nonprofit, and if I were to give anybody advice, I'd say don't start a nonprofit. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think that has become the quick way to, to connect and get engaged because there isn't necessarily a more direct path. Um, and we have to figure that out. We have to figure it out because we don't need people popping up, creating nonprofits all over the place. And then it's a struggle. We're all knocking on LaVon's door, trying to get funding and service and support for it. When we just have to figure this out, how we can more readily connect this demographic with some of the um, opportunities here and fill some of the needs uh, because we know that there are, there are lots of them. Um, I want to acknowledge Mr. Mr. Curry over here, who I'm happy to have be in your presence and my colleague Mark will, will, will say the, the words about the award that we um, prepared for Mr. Mr. Wayne Curry before his passing. But I have, a, um, I have he, he met with us around this time last year. He did a fireside chat with the honorees and it was, it was awesome. Um, and as we were planning, he would, um, he would call me and send me text messages. So I've never erased those messages. <laughs> and every now and then I listen to, um, to his voicemail because he, um, he, he, I think he knew when he met with us of his terminal illness. And just some of the things that he said to us were, will just forever stay with us. Um, I want to close with a poem. I don't get to read poems very often, but I want to, to, to use it as an opportunity to sort of set the stage okay, before I turn it over. Poem. Oh, uh, great. <laughs> I think it um, sort of sets the framing for how I view these people. It's not if. No, no, no. It's not if. It's not if. This is called to be of use. The people I love the best jump into work hat head first without dallying in the shadows or swim off with short strokes almost out of sight. They seem to become natives of the element, the black sleep heads of seals bouncing half-submerged balls. 
I love people who harness themselves an ox to a heavy cart, who pull like water buffalo with massive patience, who strain in the mud and the muck to move things forward, who do what has to be done again and again. I want to be with people who submerge in the task, who go into the fields to harvest and work in a row and pass the bags along, who are not parlor generals or field deserters, but move in a common rhythm when the food must come in or the fire must be put out. They work of the world, the work of the world is common as mud, botched. It smears the hands, crumbles to dust, but the things worth doing well, but the thing worth doing well has a shape that satisfies, it's clean, it's evident. Greek, Greek amorphous for wine or oil, hoppy vases that held corn are put in museums, but you know they were made to be used. The picture cries for water to carry and a person for work that is real. Anyway, it's called to be used, to be of use. I'm going to invite Keisha up. Yes, Christian, Keisha up to set the framework for topics of interest on the mind of 40 under 40 honorees. Thank you. So um, I have a, the task of kind of setting the tone. And one of the things that I thought about was how diverse all of the cohorts are. Right, so Social Innovation Fund and the 40 Under 40 brings together those from arts and humanities, right, the business community, education, health and fitness, public service, and science and engineering. Right, and that's literally almost every gamut that you really need to come together to really get a full picture of um, your resources in your community. And I think that being someone under 40, a lot of us are um, new to Prince George's. Some folks have been born here, were born here and lived here all your life. Um, but there's so much opportunity, I think, in our generation to do more than what our parents did, um, both socially, politically, economically. Um, we were just speaking this morning about um, just even giving. Right? and the concept of giving, giving politically and supporting women in politics and the fact that there are only two black women um, elected statewide in the country. Right? Supporting women and black people and people from our county and people who are ready to take us to the next level. Um, that's something that our generation has to do because we can't expect the older generation to continue doing their part, but we're not prepared to take the seat moving forward. And sometimes that means that we need to be more persistent, right? We need to not just, you know, when we see you give, give you a big hug, even though we love you very much, um, but we need to push the gamut on what the government is doing and what businesses are doing and what we're doing in our community and hold ourselves accountable. I think that's one of the biggest things with our generation is that we tend to be very connected. And so when you're speaking about some of the different projects and things that the, is going on in the county, I think we'd like to hear, too, of how we can be connected to that. Right? If, if I don't work for Prince George's County government, how can I know what's going on? How can I get involved in what's going on? How can I be the catalyst you need to get to where we need to go? Um, because we know that you can't do it all on your, on your own. So the combination right, of community and government and business can take um, all of us forward together. So I guess we're all here to hear what you have to say, but we're really waiting for the question and answer period where we can push a little bit more and think about how I can use my talents and resources to make the county better. Thank you, Keisha. So um, we decided to do um, a portion of the a program that was going to be at the end. We wanted to do it now um, out of respect of time and making sure that we have enough time for question and answers at the end. Um, so uh, I'm going to invite the uh, board chair, the advisory board chair, Mark Lawrence, up to come and um, present um, what an award that we actually um, announced at the last 40 Under 40 um, event um, called Forever 41. And we'll let um, Mark Lawrence uh, present it, and then we'll take a couple pictures, and then we'll jump right into the discussion. Thank you. So, so why am I presenting an award in a small group? Uh, but like we heard, you know, Mr. Curry, Mr. Wayne Curry, 
when we had that fireside chat, one of the things I walked away with personally was inspiration, right? So back to what Keisha was talking about, getting our generation involved, getting our demographic activated. 40, under 40 is really to waken the beast, right? So for my personal story, I've lived in Prince George's County 17 years, but I've really only lived in Prince George's County seven years, right? Because the first 10 years, because of my profession, I was always traveling. But once you start to have family and kids, you care more about the social services. But back to the award. So Mr. Curry, you know, the challenge is his story was very compelling. And it, to me personally, I was like, man, I'm not doing enough. You know, I need to do more. And he implored us to do that. So one of the things we talked about when we thought of this award, 40 under 40 is great. You know, being in 2012, uh, to confess, I'm over 40 now, so I can't ride that anymore. Um, so what keeps me involved? What keeps me engaged? When you care about something, you really want to succeed, right? So when I got this award in 2012, like, you know, being recognized at home, I get awards. We all get awards. So not to be arrogant, I get a lot of awards, right? So I got one at home for something that just being a resident, recognizing my talent, recognizing my accomplishments, made me compelled to give back. So translating this to this award, when we talk to Mr. Curry, a lot of it's like, look, it's your job to give back. We have this opportunity. I've laid this groundwork for y'all. Don't go ahead and mess it up. And then when he talked about legacy, it was really around aspects. So a lot of us are involved in public service, but we had the business conversation, right? Why aren't there more entrepreneurs? You know, we do deals outside the county. Why can't we do it here in the county? Um, it's not that they're not robots every way, but you have to have that fight. You know, we have to demand, we have to get involved, we have to get educated. So the theme we came up with, because the Prince George is fun, you know, 40 under 40, that's our flagship, but how do we remain that connection? Because you know, you're being asked to do a lot, but you're not being asked to do it on your own. So this Forever 41 award, the theme behind it was really to recognize folks that saw this group of individual and meaningfully sought us out. Like you said, you know, I didn't get as many texts as Tony, but I text Mr. Curry, shockingly, I got to return back, even though it was like, who, who is this? <laughs> but hey, I'll take that. So what we did, we said, okay, how do we recognize these folks? So we created the Forever 41 award. But since the events, we took a bet. So from now going forward, it's gonna be the Wayne Curry Forever 41 award. And what we'd like to do, because in symbolism, you know, we'd like to present it to family member Daryl Curry. So I'd ask if you come up, accept the award, and just maybe say a couple words to the group. And we thought it would be fitting to sort of set the context for the discussion, so if you'd like to say a couple words, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Um, I'm one of the seasoned Prince George's County residents. I'm, I'll be 65 this month, and I've spent my entire life in Prince George's County with the exception of time I spent in the Navy. And uh, we went through the school system. Of course, most of you probably are familiar with the story about the experiences that I had with my younger brother. But one of the things, maybe two of the things that really, really, really grated on Wayne was when he spoke to public servants or he spoke to entrepreneurs in the county, young people like yourselves, young people, he would admonish you not to allow fear to prevent you from accomplishing your goals in Prince George's County. And sometimes that's fear of failure. Sometimes it's the fear that when you run up against obstacles, people or institutions that want to prevent you from succeeding, that you err on the side of caution. And Wayne would flat out tell you, do not be afraid. Me, I would put it a different way. <laughs> I'd say to you, what's the worst thing that could happen if they say no? If your situation does not get worse, then having somebody say no is not the worst thing that can happen to you. In fact, if you think about what's the worst thing that could happen after they say no, you'll find a solution to circumvent them. So don't be afraid. And a no 
is just an excuse for you to find another way to get the job done. Thank you. Thank you. Today is a couple of topics, and Keisha touched on them, and Tonya touched on them. But you know, most of us in here had the pleasure um, of um, meeting Mr. Curry, interacting with Mr. Curry. And I, at least for me, I, I remember when you first, uh, I was first appointed to the job, he stopped by my office and he put on my desk uh, uh, a report on African-American boys here in Prince George's County that he did in the 90s. He was the chair of the commission um, and he, he put it on my desk and he said, um, make sure you read this and get back with me when you do. And of course, you know, I knew, um, try my hardest to impress people. Um, I'm reading up on a bunch of stuff, and I, and, and, and I just didn't know exactly what he meant. So I, it was on the side of my desk. And about a week later, he was back up here, and he knocked on my, he knocked on my uh, door and said, why the hell have you called me? <laughs> that, that was his question, and, and I knew exactly what he was asking about. And for there, we had a 20-minute discussion about um, African-American males in this county and some of the things that had not happened since that report had been put in place. So I'd like to ask you, um, you know, what role did Mr. Curry play um, in, 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 allow, in, in your leadership development. And I think, some, what are some of those lessons, a few of those lessons that um, you, you still use uh, today? Yeah, it's, we have to use the mic. Yeah, use the mic. So, um, as Tanya was reading the poem, I, I told you we're, we're a, a, a poet administration. So, with the passing of Wayne, um, I went back, actually, you know, my wife's here tonight with me, so my wife, when she finds a movie she likes, you see it like nine zillion times <laughs> until you can almost know it verbatim. But when he passed, I kept thinking there was something ringing in my head and I couldn't exactly figure out what it was. I wasn't sure if it was the Apple commercial or a movie I saw. And then I thought about it and it actually was a movie. It was the Dead Poets Society. And so there was a poem I read, must have been a hundred times, more than the movie. And I know you've heard it. It's uh, Walt Whitman. And in the movie, The Dead Poet Society, he says, Oh me, oh life, the questions unanswered, you know, paraphrasing. And in the end, it says, The powerful play goes on, and you may contribute a verse. The powerful play goes on, and you may contribute a verse. What will your verse be? And every time I would think about Wayne, and I would think about that, and it just signified to me everything that he meant to this county and what he meant to me. It was, you know, he participated in the powerful play, life. You know, we're here, life, and contributed to it. So the question for all of us, especially for you, and that's why he got involved with young people, is what will your verse be? It's like Daryl said, not being afraid. You know, that's what life is about. The only thing you can do with life is live it. And so, you know, when I, when I heard that, when I think about it, that's what I thought about with Wayne. For, for me, um, my relationship with Wayne actually goes back, and I said this a million times, um, and I'll probably say it a million more until people tell me to stop, is any good idea I've ever had came from my wife. The bad ones are mine. <laughs> so she actually, we met... Wayne Curry together. She just Actually. thought he was the smartest, craziest person she'd ever met. And she just loved him. And from that moment to this moment, she would, so when I got elected, she said, you need to go ask him if you can be his mentee. <laughs> just the th I was 35 years old. I was like, I'm going to go and ask this guy if I can be his mentee. And she kept bugging me until I actually, that all I could think about, if you knew Wayne, you know, if you really knew Wayne, the first thing you do is curse at you. <laughs> so I would go up to this guy after he's county executive, who I did not support, and, uh, which he reminded me ad nauseum. And I said, I'd like for you to be my mentor. And he looked at me like, Baker? <laughs> he said, okay. And I was like, great. This guy is going to teach me. He's going to take me places. He's going to be so nice. He's going to be that big brother like my big brother was, and what he would do is torture me. <laughs> it was pledging all over again. And he would call my house and my wife would make me answer the phone. And all I could think about was, man, I hate that guy. <laughs> you know, first of all, my name ain't, mm-mm. <laughs> it's Richard. 
<laughs> Once can you just call me Richard? I, I will end it this way. What he did for me was when he said he was going to be your mentor, if he said he was going to do that, Wayne was what, like my wife. You know, they didn't just BS you. So if he wasn't serious about it and he didn't think you were serious, he'd cut you off. <coughs> but what he taught me was how to make decisions. And then when I made mistakes, he would give me advice. And, you know, I'm pretty stubborn. Um, I would follow like, you know, maybe half on a good day. But he would never give up on me. And he would put me in places that would help me later on. And probably the best example to close off with, um, and I said this before, is I was in Annapolis my first year. And um, like everybody 35 and under, so under 40, you know what? When you make it, like when you get to your dream job, and that was my dream job. I was 17. I wanted to be in public service. It's the only thing I wanted to do in life. I was going to change the world. I just knew it. And so at 35, when I reached there, I was ready. I was hitting for the fences, you know. And Wayne called me up and he said, Baker, I need you to go meet with the speaker. And I was like, Wayne, I ain't meeting with no speaker. I don't work for the speaker. The speaker works for me. I vote for him. And that's how I said it. And he said, Baker, I want you to meet with, you know, the senior, Pete Rollins, who was chair of the appropriation. I was like, I, that guy's philosophy is different from mine. I'm not. And he called back and he kept calling. So one time he called me and he said, I need you to meet, the speaker called me. And he says, hey, I understand you want to meet with me. I was like, uh, <laughs> hell no. Because <laughs> I'm like the man. <laughs> you know, I'm running this camp. Um, and then Wayne called me back. He said, if you don't get your stupid behind, <laughs> over to that dinner with the speaker, I'm going to kill you. He said, I've been working hard to put you in a position. You're going to be the, I think it was the assistant whip or something that didn't impress me. But the point of it was, and I'll close it with this, was your election to the House of Delegates and your position there is not yours. It's for the people you represent. I'm not trying to put you in a position to help you personally. I'm trying to put you in a position to help the people you said you wanted to help. So it's not a choice. If you're not interested in leading, step back and I'll step off. It took me a while to get that, that everything that he was trying to do and even the hard ways was preparing me not for me personally, not for, for Sharon Baker to make money, but for me to make a difference in the place that he loved, which was Prince George's County, in the state that he loved, which was um, Maryland, and the people that he loved so much who had been underserved and as African Americans. And that's why this group was important to him. And, and that's why, you know, it's for me and for Daryl, it, it's, it's, it's a hard loss. You, you know, I told somebody who felt like when my dad died, you know, two things happen. One, you feel a great sense of loss, but the other is you feel like you got to grow up. I can't go, you can't go to daddy anymore. He's like, I got you here to this government. I help you pick the people who are running it. I've done everything I can do. You got to do it. So, um, um, so I think there's a, we'll move into some kind of policy specific questions, a couple, and then we'll open it up to the group. But I know personally, and I know many in this office who work here know that you put a, a lot of political capital um, uh, into changing the traje trajectory of the school system. You know, you. You stepped out there when everyone was telling you no, most of us. <laughs> most of us were saying no. Uh, and look at you, Betty in the yeah. <laughs> um, But you, you stepped out there and said you're going to do it. I remember you called and said we're going to see the Senator Miller. And we drove up there and you said, Senator Miller, is what I want to do. And he said, are you sure? And you said, I think so. And Christian, tell him what we're going to do. And we said it, we're going to do it. And then a month later, it's happened. And then the process of selecting Dr. Maxwell and several members of the board. You know, why, you know, why is the trajectory of the school system so important to you that you're willing to risk, in, in some cases, you know, your political future in this county? Um, and why did you decide to do it before the election and not yeah. after? I just yeah. wanted that personal <laughs> question, sir. I think there's a bunch of people, especially the senior leadership of this administration would like to, the Betty's back there, like to know why beforehand. Let me take the first part, um, why the school system? Um, Probably like a lot of folks who wanted to go in public service, 
education in the school system, K through 12, was not, um, you know, going to be my thing. You know, I went to do economic development, tax reform, and things like that that I thought were not, quote, unquote, African-American issues that made you broader. Um, I think the gentleman right here spoke about, you know, you lived in Prince George's County, but you really didn't live until you had children here. And the school system and things around it become very important. Um, so the school system became important as because we had, we moved here, we had one child. By the time I was elected, we had three. And my wife would not let me even think about sending them to a private school. So she didn't care if they were around the corner from the crack dealer. She was like, they're going to public schools, you'll change it if your child goes there. I was like, hell no, I need to change that before my child goes there. <laughs> but it, it made it important. But what struck me about the school system and changing it in Prince George's County was, once again, I had gotten on appropriations, a lot of it because Wayne had badgered the people to put me on there in Annapolis. He thought it would be good. And I remember I was chair of the delegation. I was in a meeting in appropriations. Actually, we had done a retreat. You do a retreat before you go into um, session. And we brought this guy in, and I've said this story you know, a lot of times before. We had just done the biggest tax break in Maryland for businesses basically trying to make ourselves competitive with Pennsylvania, Virginia, and North Carolina because we were losing people and companies. And so this guy came in who had a business in Montgomery County. And all I can remember from the retreat was that he spoke for an hour. He read every bit of his speech. And it literally was one of the most boring speeches I've ever heard. I barely stayed awake. At the end of it, Chairman Rollins asked him, he said, well, you gave this very long, and he said, good speech. And uh, <laughs> I disagreed with it. Oh, it was not good. And he said, you didn't mention the tax credits we gave you for your businesses. And the guy said, no. He said, you know what? Um, you're going to give me a tax break. That's great, because I want to know the rules up front so I can deal with it. He said, but the reason we stayed in Montgomery County and we did not move anywhere else was very simple. It was because of its public school system. He said, if I'm going to invest millions of dollars into expanding my business, I don't want to invest in a place that's going to go down in the next two to three years. And the way you judge it is through your public school system. That completely changed my thought. All the thinking I had before then about economic development, about public safety, all of those things led back to the one critical issue that no jurisdiction other than cities, cities are the only exception to the rule, can get away with you know, bad public school system. Every place else, your reputation, Montgomery County's reputation was its public school system. It was not crime. People didn't know their crime statistics. It was not how, many, how rich they were. They were seen as a place with a good public school system. Same thing with Fairfax County. It didn't even matter that the same percentage of people who sent their kids to private schools in Montgomery County is the same percentage in Prince George's County. That's your reputation. And that did it for me. I was like, in order for me to do all the things that I want to do and have Prince George's County live up to all it's going to be, it's the public school system. That's the one area Wayne and I differed on. Wayne would argue that you could build your way out of it. If I, this is a wealthy black county. If I hammer businesses to come here, if I, um, if I do all of the other things for the quality of life, I can have an okay, and he would fund education. I can have an okay system because there are choices here. You can go private. You can go public. But I contended, and we went back and forth on it yeah, up until the time I put the legislation in, that Without that, the rest of this isn't. You get that. Just think about it in Prince George's County. Then I'm going to answer the question of why then. If everything else we've happened over the last four years, which have been phenomenal things in this administration, stuff that people I wouldn't have predicted could happen. You talk about health care, the, the changes we've made there. Um, you talk about economic development, uh, infrastructure. The attitude, you know, the perception of Prince George's County, all of those things have changed for the better. If we moved our school system up two spots, just two, 
we blow the doors off everybody else. From that, if you move it up two spots, it will blow away the fact that we drop homicides by 33%. Nobody would even mention that anymore. They say, this place is kicking ass. That's why it was so important to me, because I got it. I got that people weren't going to move here unless they had, we had to move the hurdles. So why did I do it before um, the session ended, before re-election? Re-election, which is what, I, and to be honest, and anybody who knows Betty and, you know, B's back there, they can tell you, I promised people I would not touch it until re-election. And I wasn't going to, but once again, as I said, every good idea I have is my wife. So my wife couldn't sleep. And so what I would do at night is drive her around. I told the story to the school board. They thought I was nuts. Not maybe nuts. But I couldn't, you know, I, she couldn't sleep, and I'd drive her around at night. And it had to be 1 in the morning. And we went past Suitland High School, because I'd take her to places that are familiar to her. And we're parked at 1 in the morning, looking at Suitland High School. And this was after the school board had told me the three candidates they had for the school system. Looked at that school. I thought about us and the choices that we had. And I thought about what was going to happen. And I thought about opportunity. And I was like, you know what? The hell with that. I, it goes back to what Daryl said. What I was doing was playing it safe for political reason. I wasn't not doing it because I believed they were right or it was the right thing for the county. I was trying to make sure I could have a job. Well, that's never why I ran. I knew it was wrong. I knew we needed to go a different direction. And everybody else I talked to knew that. There was nobody who said, no, we don't need to make a change. The only thing they said is wait until, um, until re-election. And I probably would have almost, no, I probably wouldn't have because I'm stubborn. But then this movie came out, Lincoln. Remember I used to quote Lincoln? Yes, sir. Y'all remember Lincoln? <laughs> Did you guys see Lincoln? Yeah. <laughs> That's right. You see, so, so in, the movie, in, in the movie, they asked him, why does he want the 13, you know, the 13th Amendment now? He said, you know, you're about to go into a new inauguration. You're going to get sworn in. Why can't you wait? And he said, because the time is now. And they asked him about why he put the, you know, you know when he's pushing it, they're saying, well, you know, you did all these things and you promised it wasn't going to be about um, slavery. It wasn't going to be about freeing slaves. It was going to be about something else. And he said, you know what? I changed my mind. But I gave the voters a chance to get rid of me. And they reelected me. That's why I'm pushing the 13th Amendment. So for me, it was, I could be wrong. You know, the fact that I'm stubborn and I think this is the way we should go and we need to change it doesn't mean that I'm right. It means that I do my best guess, and that's what we do in this administration, it is all the information I have, and we use our best guess, because that's what it is. We're guessing. We're not experts. We're guessing with all the information. But I could be wrong. And even if I'm right, the citizens have a right to say, you know what, we don't like it, and you should go. And I'm comfortable with that. If I had waited, I would have denied them the ability to get rid of me when I knew this is what I wanted to do. And I wanted them to have that opportunity. Now, they still have it. Come November, they could say, that fool. And those that are close to you and those that have been around know arts are pretty personal. Um, all three of your children went to Suitland Visual Performing Arts Program. Um, two of your children went on to uh, uh, Cooper Union in New York. Um, and, and your son went on and got his master's at Yale. Um, and and, and you, you come from a pretty, you got a pretty good artistic family. <laughs> Uh, most of the paintings in this administration building are from your children. Um, right. So uh, there's, you, you've talked about arts a lot and how important it is to you, but I, I'm, this is a, a question that speaks to what role does art play in economic development? Because oftentimes arts is seen as soft skilled or you know, a leisure activity, but I know that you, you see it being much larger than that. Yeah, if you see any of the revitalization that's going on now anywhere, not just in D.C., but you go to, as you said, the, my, our children went to and, and are in New York. Um, the areas in Brooklyn that they live now, it's because of the arts, you know, both visual and performing arts. The whole quality of life, um, you know, great, great quote from Cooper Union, what they say is, um, you know, it's a 
scholarship. You get a scholarship to go there. But um, in the founding of it, Peter Cooper said, you know, every great city has great architecture, great engineering, and great art. Well, that could be any society that attracts people. And so for the arts for us, and Wayne understood this, you know, and people look at Wayne and they were like, you know, he's not really, you know, touchy-feely. No, Wayne was about dollars and cents. And when he, when he invests in the arts district, he invested in the future of the county of having people come here, live, businesses, you know, and attractions. So I think for us in the county, as we look at places, you know, like a Suitland, uh, like the Arts District in, in Hyattsville and Mount Rainier, um, we can develop that to attract those young folks and quality of life in the urban like uh, into the county. So it's very important. Um, so from an economic standpoint, it, it actually is, is a drawing people and businesses uh, foot traffic to come here. From an education, just to get to it real quickly, um, you know, I often don't talk about the two um, your children, uh, our children who are artists. It's great that they're artists and, you know, it's not something, you know, my wife and I are both lawyers, so she immediately was like, that dude needs a job. <laughs> um, but I often tell the story about the middle child who, who is a religious studies major, just graduated. Because her introduction into the art was for the reason that I think is so important in our school system, like physical education. Um, it was because we were actually put her in Highsville, true story, Highsville Middle School for uh, performing arts because I wanted her to get away from some bad kids and she was one of the bad kids I wanted away from the other kids. She was a bad influence and they were a bad influence. And I was like, you're gonna go over here to the school where your sister is. And she, um, so I would drive her to school to make sure she actually went there. And this is middle school. So I'm driving her to school and um, we would argue the whole way over there. And finally, one day I'm driving there, she said, well, I wanna be here. And I was like, oh goodness, I don't care. You're going anywhere. And she said, everybody here plays an instrument, they're in the arts, and I'm the only kid from Chevrolet that's going here because my daddy called somebody and got me here. I said, damn, daggone right. <laughs> she said, well, I'm going out, you know, I want to do something. I said, well, you can do whatever you want because you're showing up tomorrow. You're going to be at this school. I called B and hammering her. I was like, get my child in there. So the point of it is, she decided that she was going to go into theater. And I remember, Chris remembers this, I remember the first night she was going to do a performance. Now, we didn't know she had any talent other than getting in trouble. <laughs> we went there as a family to support, you know, we support your child. We went there to support her. And um, my son and I, I'm like, dude, do not laugh when she's on the stage. We're going to be support her, okay? He's like, okay, we're going to do this. We found out she actually was good. But more importantly, what it did for her self-confidence, every day for her to go to that school and get involved in the theater, get involved in the arts, the self-worth, the things that it brought out, the other qualities, using both sides of the brain, for her, it just opened her whole world. She actually became the best student in the house. But it wasn't her mom badgering her. It certainly wasn't me pleading with her. Like, I would be, I'll buy you a car if you're just good in middle school. It was something that opened up. So what it said to us, what we already know and what private schools know, and what, uh, you know, um, schools that are good in places, they don't cut the arts when funding goes down. In fact, they go left. They invest in it because they know it would expand it. And so for, to me, it was economic development, it was education, it was a better society. Great, so. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, Mr. Baker, you are the reason that I got into government relations based on interning with you um, when you I was in high school too. and deciding that this is my passion and this is the road I wanna take. Um, as far as leadership, I know we're mm. not supposed to have any regrets because every mistake or every triumph um, builds us into the person that we are um, at this point, at whatever point. Um, however, is there anything that you would have done differently um, in your political career? Oh, that's, that's an excellent question. Um, gosh. Um, yes. 
Yeah. Um, I, I, and it wasn't, believe it or not, I know people would think it's, you know, not running for county executive in 02 when I had no snowball's chance in hell of winning um, and taking the safe Senate seat, which actually looked really good at the time. And in hindsight, that just doesn't be, it was looking, it would, it would have looked really nice. You know what it was? The, the, the regret that I had, it's the one time I made a decision uh, for purely personal reasons. And that's when the Senate seat became open in 47. And I knew I wanted to run for county executive again, but I had lost twice and I thought I would never serve again. And I got nervous and I got scared. And I allowed myself, I didn't follow my wife, wife's advice, I also didn't follow and, Wayne's advice, which he never let me forget. My wife actually did. Um, and that was, if that's not where you want to be, then why are you putting your name in there? And it was because I miss my friends in Annapolis. I miss being in politics. And I miss actually doing legislative stuff that I thought I could only do as an elected official. And, you know, God was right. I didn't win it. But it put my family, my friends through all this heartache for something I really did not want and probably wouldn't have been that good at because I really wasn't passionate about going back there. So that's something I would have, you know, if I could change, I'd have let that just pass. I'd have been strong enough to say. But I was, you know, I was young. You know, I wasn't under 40, but I was 44, and I was like, geez, my clock is ticking. If I don't get back in there, I may never get back in the ring. Um, so that's probably the, 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 the biggest one. Uh, Brunson Cooper, um, owner of Corner Construction Group 2013 Core. Oh, so, um, uh, you know, this platform has propelled me to uh, many different environments uh, within the Prince George's County. I mean, we we're on, with Tonya's help, I'm also on the board of uh, Prince George's Chamber of Commerce also. Terrific. Um, but as I see a lot of work going on in the county, large, and everybody concentrates on these large projects. It's a lot of big projects going on. And I believe that there hasn't been a company grown in organically within the county that minority base that can take on uh, the large companies that come from you know, outside to do work within. Right. Now, that being said, I think there's a lot of work within the county that is small and can grow a company. But finding that work and finding that work through many different channels seems to be almost impossible, okay? And, you know, we're out there trying to grow our businesses, we're trying to do more things, but as we talk about trying to grow companies within our area, it's, it's something's missing. And I, I would say construction-wise, because I'm in that, and yes, self, selflessly I'm talking about construction. Um, I think, you know, when someone has the ability, and I'm, I'm going with Wayne is, you know, say going, and saying going after it, you know, the only worst thing they can say is no. So this is my point, you know, hey, you can tell me no, but I'm gonna still go after it. Mm -hmm. But the idea is, is that if someone's growing a company that can do great things and can really start showing the other counties around that we have someone here first, and yes, selfishly, we're gonna go after that company first and uh, grow organically. How do we get the government, along with you, mm -hmm. to help in that. Now there's been other programs, CMBD program, um, a couple of other programs that are out there, but um, I wanted to say we want help from within, not from someone outside of the county like Peterson coming and giving some money in, all these different things. So I want to understand where your point is and where your thought is on how we can create something internally and I honestly selfishly help me to go in and start showing and utilizing that and, and, and really hiring more people within the county because that's what happens. You know, as I grow, I hire more people, you mm -hmm. know, and those people come in, they put more tax dollars back into everybody's pocket. So, right. and I want that to be said, hey, I'm a Prince George's County resident. I'm a Prince George's County company. You know, I've invested with another cohort this year, opening up an office and we're sharing office space in Lanham. And I mean, really we're putting our money where our mouth is. And that's what I need the county to do also, okay? You know, it's, as you were talking, I was thinking about the fact that we asked about term limits. That's one of the downfalls of it. You start these policies, but you never get a chance to see them through. So 
Exactly what you're saying is what we started in the very beginning of the administration. We actually took our minority business and changed the name and the focus from minority business to supplier diversity. And the reason is we wanted to be in a position not just to tell people how to fill out a form, but actually how to get work and to grow because we knew in the county, both in the nonprofit world and in the private sector world, um, that we don't have enough of our companies that are big enough to take on the big projects or to actually take on the big grants that could come in here from, uh, from others. So what we started to do is one, reorganize minority business to supplier diversity, to look at ways where we can start to grow and to reshift how we, um, which is why we moved Roland Jones up to the director of central services to just do that. So it's taken us four years to, to get through the reorganization. So now we're gonna spend the next four years actually working with those um, businesses to get them to a place where they're not just, you know, can I tell you tomorrow that you'll be building MGM? No, but MGM is just one of many projects that are gonna happen in this county. They're gonna be a lot. What we wanna do is make sure companies that begin here, that are small here, grow here, hire here, can grow with the county. And so we're putting in place the opportunity to do that, working with both our economic development office, working with um, central services, and working with you know um, the administration. So we're actually doing that, and we're gonna start making sure that the people see their opportunities that are here. And, and this is part, the, 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 the final thing I'll say is, well actually let me put the nonprofit on there. One of, Levon's gone, so you guys can tell her I said something good about her. Um, one of the things that she did when we first got in here was have a day long symposium for nonprofits. Because she had all these nonprofits in Prince George's County that were really, really small and doing some really good work, but not big enough to actually go after a huge grant or Gates Foundation or anything like that because they didn't have capacity, is to get them to know each other so they can come together with some synergy and maybe over time help nurture that capacity. We're doing that with Community Foundation. But from Levon Shop, they're doing the same thing we're doing in, in the, in the um, local and minority business, and that is to help team up, but also help grow capacity. So by the time, let's say a project like um, the hospital, which is gonna be completed in 2016, 2017, well, there's gonna be work after that completion. That means we have a couple of years, we know that project's coming online, MGM's coming online. We know that if the FBI comes here, that's coming. You know, we're gonna find out about it in 2016. It's gonna take at least 18 to, to 20 months to build or somewhere around there uh, um, to, to build it. So we know it's coming and we can build capacity. And so that's what we're doing in administration. We're actually, and we would say to you, um, you know, not only look at Roland Jones shop, uh, but also look at if you're a nonprofit, what Levon's doing. And then finally, and, and this group has been really, really good at this, and that is looking at these commissions, you know, um, the boards and commissions, you know, um, you know, Monty can tell you, I mean, it's just great experience. And it's where a lot of people who go out and look at, you know, one, they get a chance to see what's coming on the pipe before everybody else does. So it keeps you aware. Uh, two, it gives you the skill level. And it actually puts you in contact with other people, you know, who may have similar ideas that you can then use to go off and, and, um, and, and do work here. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's what we want. That's why we put you there, to help us but also to gain experience. So that's one area. Level. But there are people who may want to come to the county and say, I want to move to Prince George's County, or I want to come to work in Prince George's County. So if there are some resources that could actually, like a portal or something like that, that could drive people huh. to the county um, with jobs. Lavinia, that's a good idea, isn't it? Lavinia is shaking her head. She said, that, that's a good idea. That's you know what, thank you. That's why we have this group. So you can come up with great ideas for us to steal. <laughs> but that that is no that's that's a good idea because one of the things where I, I don't know that I've thought about it and I'm in in the group certainly may be different Lavinia I don't know if you have anything to add but um, we thought about what you said in terms of businesses in terms of getting business in the county and attracting and, and getting work for businesses so they can hire more people what we haven't 
thought about is the jobs that are available here and having a one-stop shop for you know, having those available for folks as they're looking to say, hey, here's what's available in Prince George's County right here that you can go after. And that's something certainly with our economic development um, uh, organization uh, that we will look at. Because one of the things we're going to focus on is job creation. You know, we're, we've got a lot of development projects that are coming online, but what really moves the lead needle in terms of having resources are jobs. I just left Wall Street a a month ago, I felt like I got hazed again. Um, we've got all these great things going on, right, Nick, that we're doing in the county. And the thing they asked us about was, you know, jobs. How many actual jobs are going to be created? Because that's where your tax revenues come okay. from. So one we can do is look at that. That's a great idea that we'll do. And, and the other certainly is making sure we see where opportunities are here so people can grow up. So I like that. So somebody wrote that down, right? We got it. We know you got it. does advertise a lot of the jobs that are coming online through like MGM and some of the bigger projects mainly um, because these organizations approach the EDC for training opportunities so it might be just a matter of expanding that website and what they are currently doing yeah because that's a good idea because we, we focus a lot on the big project but just the normal business opportunities that are here we should be focused on so that's something um, that we'll take from here so and we might give you credit we might. We might. Uh, so we have uh, time for two more, Andreas and then uh, Mr. Patrick, correct? Um, and we'll close out with there um, and then um, a couple closing words and then I know Mr. Baker has an, another function to, to make. So Andreas and then Patrick. Good evening, everybody. Um, I'd first like to thank you for taking time out your busy day and your busy schedule to come see us and all of your staff for also um, blessing us with their presence. And all of the cohorts that are here, I'm a class of uh, 2014, I apologize I said class, I do teach in the university. <laughs> um, my point is going into education because I do teach in the university. I taught at Bowie State for five years. I'm over at Howard now. Um, my wife taught for 15 years, 16 years in the county. Um, she's the product of the county, born and raised within the county. Education is the passport to the future, for tomorrow belongs to those who prepare for it today. So as I was listening to you speak about why you pushed education at the moment that you did before re-election, it made me think of Martin Luther King's letter um, from Birmingham jail, and it was why we can't wait, right? And he, and his, he was really expressing his disappointments, um, not with the overt racist, but he was expressing his disappointments with the white moderate who said that we are on your side, we love you, we, we think that you're a great man, you're very spiritual, 40, 50 years, we're gonna give you a monument, <laughs> even though we're giving you so much hell right now. But if only you could wait, then we really could help you even more, right? And then he began to talk about personally his experiences of the life that he lived and the situations that he found himself in and having to answer questions to his wife, I mean to his wife, not only his wife, but his children, with um, outright injustice. Daddy, how come we can't go over there while all the other children are gone? And he said, when you are not experiencing that, you can answer, you can ask why we should wait. And I'm telling you why we cannot wait. So for you to push the education at, at that moment shows the commitment and the allegiance that you have to the county and to the members of this county. Because we all know, I apologize, I come from Detroit, Michigan. Um, and I, li I like PG County because it reminds me of Detroit in many ways, even though they are on the opposite ends of the economic scale. Um, but there's a certain bad idea that's associated with Detroit and it's not more so about if there's corruption or not, it's not more so if they are um, efficient or not, it's not more so if they are great leaders or not. It's really a reflection on a certain level of our ability to be great in other people's eyes, right? And so we find a lot of times we have to prove ourselves and compete on an unequal field with the Montgomery's, with whatever. And I love Wayne Curry, yourself, and the members of this group who are unapologetically committed 
to building a county that reflects us. So those who live here take it for granted, but those who come from out from out of here, we know it's a very special place in comparison to where we find ourselves in this country, right? So within terms of education, I think I was like, Tonya, my, my wife and I, we said, okay, we have to do something about education. We know the stats, we know the um, figures. So we started a nonprofit, right? And I wish I would have heard you say that before because I wouldn't have went that route, right? But now it's like, now we have an agenda, now we have uh, uh, a person in the leadership and a staff and a vision. So now what I'm thinking about and what my wife has been thinking about and those people who are concerned about the future because education is the passport, how can we now find that inroads to bring whatever services that we can, whatever skills and abilities to help foster and develop and grow the programs of education? That, that's, that's, a good, that's a good question. And first of all, uh, you know, Wayne would have loved to hear you say that because that, that, that is Wayne. And when he talks about, um, you know, this county going from majority white uh, and rural to majority black and uh, education income went up, he really was answering the question about can we actually self-govern? Right. That was the big thing for him. He's like, you know what? We're as good as anybody else. We can govern. And he was also very, uh, that's why he had such an ethical government. He wanted to make sure that if you lifted up the, the, you know, the rug, you weren't going to find anything. And it's why, you know, but, but that was his whole thing is because they expect us to fail. And he was like, they ain't going to, you know, and that's why he beat me up when I got in here. He was like, Baker, you can't mess up. <laughs> this is our opportunity. It was our. It wasn't even like your opportunity. It was our opportunity So on that. The other way to help is for us in the county, just answer from Prince George's County government. You know, we made very clear our focus on our Transforming Neighborhoods Initiative. Those are the six areas in Prince George's County. If you look at every indicator, those are the areas that are, have our most challenges. So where we take our time and talent and resources, we're focusing first on those areas. That includes education, which is the next big step for us. So when nonprofits come to us and say, we want to help, the first place we say is great. Here are the areas that are in the most need. Those are where we're going to focus on. Um, and, and so that's how you partner with us. If you come to us in any of our TNI areas, we want to do that. The other place is that we've got our Commission on Excellence in Education, which is really designed to be the think tank about innovative eyes, ideas in Prince George's County that advises the county executive directly. We took it out of the school system and uh, in the school board to say, we know some of this is controversial. Uh, but the idea is if we, and we don't want to take resources away from the school system, we want to say if there are great ideas, you know, a nonprofit comes up with like a terrific, innovative idea that you want to test here. Because sometimes we got to test them and see if they work. Then that's the place where we can vet it out and say, well, you know what? It's worth investing some money to see if it works. And we're not taking resources away from the school system or the school board. We're taking county dollars and just like with our EDI fund. We're investing in the future and taking a risk. So that's another area where, where you could help us with and advise us. And Christian and, and knows a lot about that. Know a little bit about it. So <laughs> we'll, we'll definitely connect. I will say that Mr. Baker in particular has been pretty heavily engaged in, in, in providing um, opportunities for um, citizens, nonprofits, business leaders who are interested in education. To, to engage in that conversation. So oftentimes you say, oh, well, talk to the school system. And he's not like, talk to me. Um, and, and I've seen it firsthand. We, he, he'll pull someone on the street will say, I got a great idea, and I'll get a call. And they'll say, Mr. Baker told me that he, they support, he supports my idea. We got to figure out how to make it work. <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> sure enough. And, our, and my job, and, and he told us up front, and, and um, before Mr. Uh, Majet, uh, Brad Seaman, the former CAO, said that mm -hmm. our job is to find a way to say yes and not no. Mm -hmm. um, and the yes may not be yes tomorrow, but here's a pathway, here's a process, who's the right person that you need to talk to, and, and here's can, the email from us right, that says If I can piggyback it. onto what, what Christian said, so a lot of times, I don't vet out ideas. If you came to me with an idea, I don't say, oh, okay, well, no, we don't want to do that. Because what I want to do is that's why we have the commission set up to actually come in there and see, because it may be something 
that we haven't thought of. Simply because we haven't done it before doesn't mean that it's not a great idea or something we need to do. And simply because it won't work. It may not work, but we don't know. And so what I'll, and Christian's right, somebody will stop me on the street and say, I got this great idea that's going to turn around the school system tomorrow. I said, thank you very much. Here's Christian Rose's number. Because he's dying to hear a great idea that will turn around that's the school right. system. And, and, he's and excited. I'm extremely excited. And, <laughs> and, we, and some of them, you know, not all, but some of them, ha I can show you places that they've actually been implemented. And we've invested or got the school system to invest from a pilot perspective. And we about to do work. Jamal's idea. He just yeah. gave, gave up a good one tonight. Awesome. So one last question, and we're rolling out about two minutes um, before we have to wrap up. I think we're over, almost over 8 o'clock. Good evening, everyone. Mr. Baker, I'm Patrick D. McCoy, member of the 2013 cohort and also the Performing Arts columnist for Washington Life magazine. Um, I was thoroughly moved by your story, the fact that at first you didn't have the buy-in until you actually saw your daughter on the stage. And uh, I wrote my question there, so I didn't forget this technology. I had a topic. So basically, um, a lot of times in the arts, the perception is that the arts is just entertainment. You just buy a ticket, that's it. What can we do in the county to encourage our students to see the arts as a more of a serious career? There are other things that you can do in the arts besides get on the stage and perform. There's media, there's arts journalism, and so forth. So I'd like to see your perspective on that. No, you're absolutely right. We actually had the Undersecretary of Commerce in here yesterday talking about uh, the number of people, statisticians, uh, I know I'm using the wrong word, they do data and all that stuff, uh, that's coming over to Suitland. And one of the things that they have, one of the biggest um, equipments they're going to bring in there is they do a lot of video production and things like that. And they said, well, it would be great to hook up with the performing arts. Um, they also do a lot with numbers, and they know that, you know. Um, so it's just exposing the opportunities and careers uh, to our kids that are right now alive and to their parents. You know, because like I said, my wife's first reaction to my son was, uh, I, I can't afford a starving artist. And there are just many opportunities. You, and, and, and I think, you know, um, uh, showing them that it actually helps you perform better in math, reading, writing, verbal skills, you know. And so those are the things. Um, music, you know, is great with math students. And so um, theater, you'd be great, great lawyers, <laughs> great politicians. <laughs> I could have used some theater classes. But I, I think just exposing them to many careers that come out of it and the fact that a lot of folks don't actually go into the visual performing arts or the, um, or the visual arts. And, you know, the, the bottom line, though, I think for all of us is really what we're trying to get at is a better society, you know, better quality of life. And if you go back to the poem that I, that I read, um, it really was what makes life great and it's the arts so we do it because we want people to have that sense of quality of life and better life and the arts provides that and it makes you well-rounded um, it's probably the best way to close it okay, thank, you. thank you so with that well, thank you, mr baker thank you, mr baker for his time and energy we appreciate it um you're able to walk out for <laughs>